Blossom by ConsultWebs. Breakthrough insights to build a thriving law firm with your host, Tanner Jones. Hello, all you awesome listeners. Today on our show, we're going to be talking with Mike Ehrenstein, business trial lawyer and partner at Ehrenstein Sager, a business law boutique providing bespoke trial and transactional services to select clients. Through three decades of trial practice, Mike has applied martial arts wisdom to benefit his clients throughout his entire legal career. He has won unprecedented recoveries for clients involved in a variety of disputes, from aviation engines to agricultural, from architects to accusations of legal malpractice. He's protected clients from hundreds of millions in liability risk. Mike has experienced in a wide range of substantive areas, but his areas of expertise are in international conflicts, energy, aerospace, transportation, professional negligence, real estate, construction, and even healthcare law. Today's topic is why boutique firms should focus on mastering resources allocation to confront global firms successfully. Welcome, Mike. Thanks for joining the Lawsome Show today. Well, thank you very much for having me, and welcome to all the Lawsome listeners out there. You put together a great podcast, and I very much appreciate being invited to participate. Well, I, I think we, we all have a treat in store for this conversation. So if you don't mind, let's just jump right in with my first question here. You, you, you mentioned global law firms dominating the market today. That's something that has stood out and just, just looking through some of the messaging and, and your overall approach. But many boutique firms, I think just to simply state, they're struggling to keep up. They're struggling to grow their businesses. And ultimately, they're struggling to meet more prospective clients where they're at. But there's, a, there's an element that can make a true difference between what we would consider success and failure for some of these smaller law firms, and that's what you refer to as resource allocation. So let, let's start just by covering that topic in and of itself. What does it mean to master resource allocation within a boutique law firm, Mike? Well, thanks for asking the question. Um, and let me, let me step away for a second from, from using... The, the jargon. And let's just talk for a second about what we're really trying to identify here. Resource allocation really means how much money do you have or does your client have to accomplish a particular task. And the money is the resource and how it gets allocated is how you, how you invest it into accomplishing the tasks that need to be, to be done. So when we're competing against global law firms, whether we're competing for a client or whether we're competing in court, there is no doubt that these global law firms have more resources, more money to be able to throw at problems than the boutique firms like mine that compete against them. Mm -hmm. And so larger and more money doesn't necessarily have to equate to more effective. It can, it can, but it doesn't necessarily. So if you think about the way resources are allocated in, in a battle, in a war, you can have an army of 400,000 soldiers, or you can have uh, strike forces of, of small uh, uh, special operators. Mm -hmm. And maybe you need both, but maybe you can be very effective with a SEAL team rather than sending in a huge army. How, how we as boutiques allocate our resources, whether in marketing or whether in the courtroom, if we try to say we're going to be the army, we're going to get crushed. Mm -hmm. We can't compete force on force and say, we have the same resources. So we have to compete a little bit more uh, carefully, a little more judiciously. So a little, another little, like, you know, I love the martial arts, so I, I have to analogize everything to the martial arts. You can, you can picture in your mind a, a fight that is about to take place between a sumo wrestler and a, a very, uh, spry um, karate student. 
if the karate student gets too close, that sumo wrestler is just going to wrap him up in his big arms and squash him. We don't want to be that guy. We want to be the guy that looks at the sumo wrestler and says, he's really big and strong, but you know what? His groin is open and I can, I can cause a lot of damage and make him not want to fight with me so hard if I, if I strike that particular target. So resource allocation means a lot of different things. It can mean legal strategy. What motions are we going to file when? What tactics are we going to use in trial? How are we going to gain the discovery we need? All of those are related to resource allocation. But at the end of the day, there's two major components of resource alloc allocation that I think, or categories of resource allocation that I think really can make the difference for boutique firms competing against global firms. And those are allocations into technology, investments into technology, mm -hmm. and investments into, into relationships. Do you know how many cases you're signing from your marketing investment each month? If you want to diagnose the status of your firm's marketing efforts, then the Lawson Podcast has a gift for you. Discover the best and the most unique legal marketing solutions available today using the Decision Making Handbook's free printable criteria. Claim your copy in the bio below. Let's let's explore those uh, a little bit. I mean, because that's the natural question. I mean, I, I get the analogy. It makes perfect sense. It's being in, intentional or, or scrappy, even uh, strategic with your with your efforts, whatever that may be, whether like you said, whether it's in acquiring new clients or whether it's going to trial or serving your client. So the bigger question would be, what are some of those uh, what are the, some of those steps in terms of balancing the limited resources with achieving goals? How, do you, how would you advise a law firm begin to take those steps if they're considered a boutique law firm? So um, I'm going to break it into two pieces, if that's okay. Please. I'm going to first talk just a little bit about technology, and then I'm going to talk a little bit about relationships. Okay. Um, with respect to technology, I, you, you have to spend the time to educate yourself as to what the technology is that's out there. And th th for everything that a law firm can do, there is a technology that exists to make it smarter, faster, cheaper, uh, more efficient. Mm -hmm. Okay. The topic of technology and law practice technology for us is like, you know, we, we have 30 minutes to talk today. Maybe there's no way we can even really scratch the surface on what's available. But what I can tell you is that it's very worthwhile to spend the time to investigate what technology exists and to see where you can find a fit between technology and your practice and then pursue it with vigor. Pursue it with vigor. Because that technology can make all the difference in the world in how you actually end up competing. And I'll give you just one example of technology that we were able to deploy successfully. There was a case in the last 10 years, it was a large case um, where there was, we were going up against a, a much, a firm with much better resources, much larger resources. And so uh, there was a, an exchange of data between the firms for discovery. And when we looked at it and analyzed it, the, um, the volume of discovery that was exchanged was in excess of 12 terabytes of data, hmm. which if I, we, we actually did the calculation, if all of our lawyers spent 12 hours a day, every day, looking at these documents, it would take us more than a decade to be able to make sure that we've looked at every piece of paper. Right around the same time, uh, predictive coding, which is a computer-assisted review technology for very large uh, uh, um, volumes of, of discovery, was starting to make make it into the in, into the uh, into the legal world. Mm -hmm. And this computer-assisted review, we were the first case in Florida 
that I know of. I think we were the first case in Florida that actually convinced the court to require the parties to use computer-assisted review in order to identify the most relevant documents for the case. And the result of that was that these 12 terabytes of data were reduced down to about 100,000 really key documents. And those were further reduced down to about, I'm guessing, I'm trying to recall, maybe 300 uh, really uh, relevant documents that were admitted into evidence. Mm -hmm. Now, we got there using technology, which cost us a a, a minor, minor, minor fraction of what it would have cost to actually go through and look at the documents. The computer assisted review helped us uh, realize the relationships between some of the documents that we might not have been able to realize on our own without investing a lot more time. Mm -hmm. And it leveled the playing field because our opponent could have said, look, Ehrenstein, Sager, that little whippersnapper firm over there, they, they, they've only got a few lawyers. Let's throw a hundred document reviewers at this. They can go spend their time looking at this. We have the resources to pay all those document reviewers. We're just going to bury these guys. They have no idea what they're getting into. At the end of the day, we were in agreement with opposing counsel as to what the relevant documents were, how we were going and which ones were admittable, admissible and which ones weren't. And it was all because of the technology. Every year we make predictions about legal marketing trends that will affect hundreds of thousands of lawyers across the country. If you've been looking to reach new clients, stay informed, or gain a competitive advantage in your market area, this is your opportunity. Unlock the secrets of success with this exclusive PDF that reveals some of the top legal marketing trends in the industry today. Claim your copy in the bio below. Yeah, you, you don't always have to fight fire with fire. In fact, it's it's often more advantageous to, to be Not. strategic there. Absolutely. So that's another martial arts thing. You never have to go and you kind of don't want to go. I don't want to ever, when I'm fighting, match strength to strength unless I know that I am overwhelmingly stronger than the other side. Right. I would much rather allow their strength to dictate the direction that we're going to go for them to lose. So I agree with you. We don't want to match strength on strength when we're fighting or competing against larger law firms and technology helps us level that playing field or even to give us the advantage. I'd, I'd like to move into the second piece on the relationship side that you mentioned. But before we do that, I, I have to ask because I, you know, I, I work with lawyers and I have done so for over a decade now. And the legal profession is not always the most technologically savvy. And, and so there's this often this resistance, uh, whether it's fear based, whether it's just simply, you know, plain ignorance, unaware. Mm -hmm. I, I'd be curious to know. So this the software that you're referring to, and we're seeing this type of software pop up all over the industry to help create efficiencies and operations, especially when it comes to, um, you know, whether it's, you know, writing demand letters or uh, writing briefs or scouring, like you say, hundreds of thousands of documents. Um, what forced you to go that direction, Mike? If you could speak to that, maybe was it was the software introduced to you, or or did you go out and find the software based on a specific pain point or need? Can you speak to that? That is a great question, and the the truth is, I wish I could tell you I went out and scoured the the the, the technological world and found what I needed. That is not what happened. Um, I was completely unaware of this technology and I was introduced to this technology. I'm, I'm, I'm a fellow of the Litigation Council of America and there was a, a presentation made at one of our uh, semi-annual meetings mm -hmm. by a predictive coding company and I was floored by the technology. I, was, I could not believe how th th that a technology could do what they were saying it could do. Mm -hmm. And about six months later, I found myself in this case with the 12 terabytes of data. And I said, we got to try this. <laughs> and that's when I went and we went and hired them and, and we had a great experience. I mean, and what's crazy about it is that that case was, you know, 10 years ago or so or five mm -hmm. years ago. The cost 
of doing that same technologically aided review now is a fraction of what we paid for it then. And it, it's also the, the technology that's out there now to do this kind of review is a, about a hundred times more powerful than it was then. So as well as it worked for us then, today, it's better, faster, cheaper. And I, I got to tell you, like I said before, there, there's nothing that a law firm does or that a lawyer does for which there is not some technology out there to make it better, faster, cheaper. For us, we litigate. And when we litigate against large firms, one of the pain points is discovery because we can get outweighed in the discovery battle. So this was a good technology to resolve that issue. But wherever that law, your law firm's pain point might be, that's where you should be looking for te technological assistance. Hiring an outside marketing agency can take your firm's business truly to the next level. But having to compare and contrast different legal vendors out there can be a rather overwhelming and complicated process. So we'd like to help you with that. That's why we've created this free digital vendor checklist. It's gonna give you the tools and more importantly, the confidence needed to truly evaluate and vet the potential vendors out there. It's gonna help you understand specifically their legal marketing expertise, team qualifications, what they can and cannot do, types of services they offer and expectations of those services, proof of success. Have they been there before? Have they helped other similar law firms like yours? and arguably, more importantly, your digital ownership rights related to working with them and what you own or do not own. Claim your free printable checklist in the comments below. I think that's a solid point to wrap up that, uh, that piece. And, and the, the subtle takeaway there that I heard that I would encourage our listeners, Mike, you were willing to go out there and, and attend conferences, even specifically tech-oriented seminars and workshops in an effort to continue to learn and educate yourself on your business. And I actually just got back from a, a tech conference last night, a legal-specific tech conference, and artificial intelligence and software was the key theme, you know, and that's what these firms are talking about of doing exactly what you're suggesting is being much more strategic and ahead of the curve in competition. And you often don't have to allocate near the level of resources or money when you're able to um, be more strategic than, than the opposing counsel. So I think that's such an important takeaway. But let's move into the relationship side, because I think that, you know, obviously, I think there's clear benefit in the tech world. But what about the, the relationships or even the networking side playing a critical role on this topic? So the global law firm has offices in, let's say, 15, 20 different cities around the world. Through their satellite offices, they have lawyers with ex various levels of expertise in various topics. The, the boutique law firm can't say that I don't have an office in Luanda, okay? But what I do have that most global law firms don't is I have friends, relationships that I've built over time with people there. So when I have the, it's interesting, there's like the yin and the yang of, 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 uh, of competition here. On the one hand, we have Technology is this cutting, cutting edge uh, force multiplier that, that you can use to have these fights against global law firms. And at the end of the day, the thing that makes the biggest difference in my mind is old fashioned relationships mm -hmm. and relationship building. You've got to invest the time to generate genuine, trusting relationships with quality, quality people. I've been very lucky over the last 33 years or so. I have been able to, through a ver variety of means, develop real relationships, not, hey, this is some guy's name on a list somewhere that, I, that I've seen, mm -hmm. or, or, or some law office that, you know, is on a list from, from that's provided by, uh, you know, a, a, a book. These are genuine relationships that I've developed over a long period of time. And through these networks, I, 
I gotta say, there's there's probably there there are probably not many jurisdictions. I'm sure there's some, but there's probably not many jurisdictions where I can't find or I don't know somebody that I have a trusting relationship with that I can end up counting on that person to either help me or help me find the person who can help me. Mm-hmm. That works really, really, really well when it comes to time to actually litigate disputes that are all over the place. And it it's really, really helpful when you're competing for business. Mm-hmm. So when I'm oftentimes the, a global law firm, I, I will be competing against a global law firm for a piece of business representing, let's say a sovereign nation. And the sovereign nation will say, well, I mean, they have a lot, the, this big firm, they have, they're they a very big firm and they have a lot, all this gravitas. They have this reputation and, you know, you're a little pipsqueak from, from, uh, from Coral Gables. Why, why would we go with you? And my answer to that would be, well, does this global law firm have anybody that lives in your neighborhood? Because I do. Mm -hmm. Does this global law firm have the PR relationship in your country? Because I do. Does this global law firm have the lobbying relationship that you need in your country in order to be able to make things happen here? Mm -hmm. Because, Because, and I'm not, I'm not saying this to, you know, pat myself on the back too hard. But a global law firm, and again, I don't want to, let me, let me back up for a second. What I don't want to do is say global law firms all suck because they don't. There's a lot of, there's some great lawyers. They do great work. They have great coverage and they provide a great service. All I'm suggesting is that when I'm competing with them, sometimes smaller is better. And the relationships that I've invested in make the difference between who gets the work and who doesn't. Mm -hmm. Those relationships are, are key. Hey there. Perhaps most don't associate lawyers with the social media platform TikTok, but I would encourage you to think again if that's you. The reason being is TikTok is now the number one most engaging social media platform on the market. It presents truly a lucrative opportunity for lawyers who know how to use it and use it effectively. If you're interested in leveraging TikTok for your law office, grab the free resource in the comments below. I see that played out in in the industry literally day after day. You you cannot underestimate the power of a vast network. And and I think all too often, I mean, it's interesting you countered, you know, the, the two main points here, technology and relationships, but how often do law firms tend to, they see this technology continuing to roll out and they just continue to invest and continue to implement while neglecting the network. And in many instances, often thinking the technology is going to overtake. But again, you've stressed the point, which I fully agree with, you can never um, underestimate the power of that network. And it's something you should be feeding into on a regular basis. You, you've practiced law for many decades, and that's what it takes it right. takes years of experience in working and interacting to build that. Yes, I, I got to tell you that. First of all, building the building the relationships. It's it's fun. It's something that, that that every lawyer should be doing because it's good for their career. But also, it just happens to be a fun thing to do. The I, maybe it's just me, but I like people. My I, I I genuinely enjoy meeting new people and making new relationships and trying to keep up with people. It's, it's a fun part of the practice. Um, so definitely that investment needs to be made, but it's like any other investment. Sometimes you make bad investments. Sometimes your investments don't work out and you got to be willing to, you know, drop it and move on to the next one. But having a broad, broad network, I've been blessed to have the network that I've garnered i was president of the lca last of the litigation council of america last year that's 3500 of the top trial lawyers in the country Mm -hmm. um i'm a a member of abacus worldwide which has about 100 accounting and law firms worldwide i'm 
I've been a member and participated in meetings with the Africa Energy Chamber. There's, there's relationships that I've generated by, but the, the other thing that is important is to networking for networking's sake has never been, in my mind, an effective way of generating business. Networking to create genuine relationships with people where people actually get to know you and you get to know them and you start to build bonds of trust, those count. Those are gold, but they're hard to come by and you, you've got to spend time to do it. That's a, that's a solid takeaway. Let me let me change directions on this a little bit because we've, we've obviously covered how boutique law firms are or should be allocating resources effectively and efficiently. We've talked about the importance of being strategic. Um, you don't always have to be the heavyweight. Um, you can be scrappy and be very intentional and still do an incredible job and win for clients. But what about some of the challenges? We haven't covered too much on that. Challenges that boutique law firms are facing, not, not only, you know, in resource allocation, but in confronting some of these large firms. Any advice you'd give our listeners beyond what we've already talked about on how they could begin to strategically overcome some of these obstacles that a lot of boutique firms face today? Know the power of your differentiation, number one. Big firms, there, there, there is a, a place and particular clientele who is always going to go for that big firm because it's comfortable. It's the safe choice. But know that as a small firm, you can offer things sometimes that a big firm doesn't, right? You can be a little more flexible. You can be faster, you can be cheaper, uh, or not cheaper, less expensive is the way I would put it, okay? Those are differentiators when you're competing in the marketplace. And when you're competing in court, a larger firm a lot of times is gonna walk in with the gravitas that accompanies its name. So, which is great, that name means something. There's a brand associated with it for the judge or the jury. We have to compete against that by um, just being better. We have to compete by saying, first of all, I'm not intimidated by your gravitas. Don't flinch. I can't tell you how many times I've gone up against large law firms where they send in the person who is the head of the department who has a great reputation and is an obviously smart person, but definitely does not know his case as well as I do. Mm. So don't flinch, have the courage to stand in the ring, have the courage to take the shot and to give a shot mm -hmm. and know that very likely you know your case much better than he does or she does. Although you might not know it as well as his uh, lead associate. Okay. So that's a differentiator that you can, that you can really build upon. So one, have the courage, don't flinch Two, hustle. You got, you've got to know this stuff inside and out, backwards and forwards and upside down. You've got to know it better than they do. I'll give you just a, a quick little anecdote. If I, I don't want to run up against your time limit here, but if, if you have a second, yeah. there's a, a, a recent case in which we, we represented a, um, a, small, a smaller landowner against a very large company that was represented by a very large law firm. And they sent their biggest real estate uh, litigator to come face off with us in a mediation. And it became very apparent very quickly that we weren't backing down off of our claim in spite of, you know, how they, they swaggered into the, to the, to the mediation. We're not getting anything out of this. Okay. We'll see. And it became very apparent very quickly that we knew their documents a lot better than they did. Mm. And so when they would say, well, you, you know, uh, we, we never we never spent the money that we were supposed to spend on improving the property. We were able to show them, well, your documents say differently and here's where you showed it to, here, here's where you gave it to me. 
by being better prepared and by having the courage to face off against them, we were able to gain a, a very, very nice result for the client. Well done. Don't be intimidated and hustle hard. I, I love love that advice, and and it's an encouragement for those firms that that do find themselves being a boutique firm and and often up against the the giant, you right. know, and 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 that's that's something that's important, you know, the confidence in it too. And when someone's calling in, especially from an from an intake or a, a client conversion standpoint, knowing your differentiation, I cannot stress how valuable you know as a marketer and being in the industry that is gold. And if you don't have that that's just rolling off the tip of your tongue. That's one of the first place to start, in yeah. my opinion. And I think, um, you know, you've lived it out. And I appreciate that you pointed it to that. But let me let me ask a, a final question here on boutique firms. We've talked a lot about, you know, overall strategy and, and, and how to approach this and the right mindset to have. But how do you objectively begin to evaluate success or measurement? When it comes to you know the decisions that you're making and 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 proper resource allocation, what have you looked at objectively to determine success or failure over the short or long term with these types of strategies? So um, we're pretty uh, strict about measurement. We we try to identify, and it's a very difficult thing to do, but we try to identify. Um, measurable metrics that are related to the investment that we're making and then see if we can if we can spot results directly related to it at the end marketing efforts pr efforts um, are notoriously difficult to be able to say well i spent you know x dollars on this particular networking opportunity and uh, as a result of that, I received Y dollars in referrals. Mm -hmm. It's really hard to make that connection. But if you do it for a long enough period of time, and in my case, it's been a long, I'm, I'm old, it's been a long time. <laughs> but if you do it for a long enough period of time, you can, you can definitely see that there is a certain number of referrals that are coming from the networking effort, but it takes time and you've got to be willing to make that investment over time. You've got to pick a metric, pick a time frame that makes sense and then try to measure. It's very difficult to do, but it's not like it needs to be a perfect science. I'm, 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 I'm thinking kind of like, you know, a rainbow. When you look at a rainbow, you, you know, there's, different colors in the rainbow, but where one color stops and the next one definitely begins, you can't really tell. There's not a bright line right there, but I know, look, that's red and that's blue. I can do the same thing with our, our, our investments into, into networks and also into technology. I can say for sure there's a connection between the investments that we're making and the results we're achieving, how precisely I can define that connection, it's, it's, it's a judgment call. And I, there's wisdom in that, right? It's not, you know, it's, it's never going to be perfect. It's, there's not a perfect science and there's too many, uh, too many touch points uh, along the way, you know, to where one, one is unable to, to entirely drill it down. But just as you're saying, you establish a, Establish a goal and an objective way to, to monitor it. And the biggest thing is, at least in what I hear in that, is it's accountability. Accountability to decisions and making sure you're seeing it through and having enough data around it to determine success or failure and be willing right. to set it aside if it doesn't meet that standard and continue to move on. Definitely. You've got to be. That's the other thing. One of the things that we didn't really talk about that, uh, yet anyway is you know, making, making investments in or allocating your resources into technology or into networks or into anything. There's, we've spoken about the upsides, mm -hmm. right? But there's always a downside. And the downside, I mean, maybe I touched on it a little bit before is you can make a, you can make a bad investment. Sure. Right. And so 
the, there's always a risk associated with your, your, your allocation of a resource. And the risk is that it doesn't work out and you've wasted that, 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 that resource. Um, you could be too early into a technology that doesn't get fully adopted. You can be right on time and not be able to implement the adoption properly in your firm. Mm -hmm. uh, you can invest in relationships that turn out to be sour. Those things happen. And you have to realize that every investment that you make isn't going to be, you know, a home run. Mm -hmm. Like you have to have the courage to go in and not flinch when you're fighting against a global law firm. You have to have the courage to be honest with yourself and know when it's time to say, you know what, this one isn't working out. Let's change. That's it. And that's happening more and more. The, 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 the need to have that flexibility now is more important than ever because things are changing dramatically and faster than ever. That's it. So when you look at like, just look at for a second, the, the way I used to do legal research when I was in law school, there was a big library with lots of books in it. <laughs> and today it ain't done that way. <laughs> And the way it's being done now, even the way I think I'm like pretty proficient using uh, computer research on, on say, for example, Westlaw or Lexis, I, I get it. I know how to use that, th those tools. Those tools are going to be the way they're being used now. It's changing so fast. Those tools are going to be obsolete the way they are now quickly mm -hmm. with the advent of, of artificial intelligence uh, and other types of generators you know things are changing so fast that we need to be able to grab the opportunities when they're there and let go of them quickly when they're not there or when they're not working well said and the concept of we we often say failing forward right you, know, you you're going to make you're going to make bad investments you're going to make you're going to allocate resources in the wrong way sometimes even if it's the most strategic or well thought out path fell forward, see it as progress and continue to go. Mike, I've really enjoyed this, this conversation. Are there any final points that, that you didn't have a chance to cover that you'd like to cover as we wrap up? Not at all. I really appreciate you spending the time with me and, and, uh, I appreciate the opportunity to speak with you and all your awesome listeners. <laughs> Well, we enjoyed it, Mike. What's the best way for our listeners to contact you? Anybody can contact me anytime. My office number is 305-503-5930. And my email is mike at Ehrenstein Sager. That's E-H-R-E-N-S-T-E-I-N Sager, S-A-G-E-R dot com. And thank you very much for the opportunity. Thanks again, Mike. Blossom by ConsultWebs with Tanner Jones. For show notes, links, and info, go to consultwebs.com slash podcast. Be sure to subscribe and leave us a review. Watch for the next Blossom episode to discover more breakthrough insights to build a thriving law firm.